This episode of Gators Breakdown is brought to you by MyBookie. Use promo code GATORS on the deposit of $500 or more, and you can claim a bonus of up to $200. Visit MyBookie.ag for more details. This episode of Gators Breakdown is also brought to you by Shark Coatings. Get a different kind of gift this holiday season. Visit SharkFloorCoatings.com when you need professional floor coating services done right the first time. Want more Gators Breakdown? Join Gators Breakdown Plus. Starting at $3 a month, get access to unique episodes, plus a blog, chat room, giveaways, shout-outs, and more. Gators Breakdown Plus is furthering the interaction with fans and listeners like you. Head to GatorsBreakdown.SupportingCast.FM to join Gators Breakdown Plus today. Gators Breakdown, because there's never a dull moment in Gator Nation. The Gators Breakdown podcast is ready to go. I'm your host, David Waters. You can find me on Twitter at GatorDave underscore SEC. Joining you right here on this Monday night, fresh off of a big weekend of recruiting here to talk about it. Will Miles, of course, right here on Monday night, as he is every Monday night. You can find him at readandreaction.com. His site, Read and Reaction, on uh, YouTube, of course, and on Twitter at Will Miles SEC. Will, hey, we got Bob Redman with us for the first time on Gators Breakdown. Yeah, man, it's good to have somebody here who's an expert, has some inside information about what's going on with, you know, obviously we got a game coming up this weekend, but uh, I think <laughs> people have already sort of pointed all their attention towards recruiting and what's going on in 2023 and 2024 now as well, now that G- DJ Lagway is in the fold. So great to have Bob here with us. Yeah, Bob, thanks for doing this. Uh, of course, uh, in a new avenue with the Gator Collective and the Gator Collective uh, message board uh, going on there, and you share your thoughts there and uh, writing some pieces there for the Gator Collective. Uh, thanks for hopping on Gator's Breakdown. Yeah, I love being here, guys. And, uh, you know, like you Will said, it's a big week with recruiting, and uh, I think uh, people will focus on the game probably Saturday only and then back to the recruiting finish for the for signing day. So, that's the way it is. I mean, six and six team. I think that's that's probably par for the course. And then you hope the recruiting's a whole lot better. And it it looks like it's aiming that way. So we'll see. Absolutely, you know, a big finish hopefully uh, is on the horizon. And look, we got just a couple more days <laughs> before we get five star <laughs> offensive lineman Samson Okanola in his decision and where he'll go. We'll get into that, of course. Visited Gainesville this past weekend. Uh, not too long before that as well. Uh, Florida getting creative with some, uh, some some still shots, some photos uh, to go along with him. So uh, lots of fun uh, to be having these visits uh, there with recruits. But, uh, Bob, before we get started, uh, let everybody know out there uh, with your new adventure uh, with the Gator Collective and what's going on there, all the benefits, of course, uh, to get all your insight, all the inside info of what you bring to the table, what so many others bring to the table there. First, you got to join the Gator Collective uh, to be a member, and then you get access to the Gator Collective message board for an extra five bucks. So uh, let everybody know what type of info, what they can find there on the Gator Collective. Yeah, so so the main thing is we're trying to drive traffic to the collective itself. And, uh, you know, it's a $10 minimum per month charge for the collective. Um, but just trying to do everything we can to, to try to move people to, to help support the Gator athletes. And, um, it, you know, it's working. Uh, there's all kinds of things working. I think, I think the Gator collective and and the different NIL groups of Florida are, is really one of the strongest, uh, collaborative, if you will, out there. And I think we're, you're starting to see the, you know, the benefits of that. And I think you'll see that again when the, uh, you know, when they really start going into the transfer portal a little bit more. So, um, we're, we, we started a message board, uh, you know, we're, we're a, uh, uh, no bashing players, no bashing coaches. You can, you can criticize, you can criticize a coach or, or a player, uh, but you, you know, you can't say they suck or whatever. You can't, mm-hmm. we're not going that far, but, but we're a message board. We, we try to bring information that we can get. Um, whether it has to deal with NIL, whether it has to do with the recruiting weekends. Uh, we do spring practice reports. 
uh, fall practice reports the, the the month leading up to the season uh, insider stuff that you can't get anywhere else. So we're, you know, we're trying to make a community and build on that community. And, you know, as, as Napier talks about, um, you know, the, the 470,000 Gator alumni that are out there, um, you know, we've got to tap into that number and get as many of those people given 10, 20, 30, 50, whatever they can give, and, and once you do that, I honestly believe, and he believes this too, is that this place, you know, if you can get to that level, uh, you don't expect 470000 to do that. But if you can get to that level of all those people or, or a, a large majority of those people tapping in at $10 a month, you've really done something. And that'll be – nobody else will be able to compete with that. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of good stuff there. This past weekend, Bob had a – by what, three or four updates throughout Saturday and Sunday uh, as the visits were happening. Uh, so a lot of good info there. Bob will you know, share uh, a lot of what he shared this past weekend there. So you kind of get a preview uh, of what you can hear uh, and, and see uh, on the Getty Collective board there. So, all right, everybody, hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't done so yet while you're watching right, live right here on Gators Breakdown, if you're watching live on the YouTube version or if you're watching the replay. Like, subscribe really helps us out here on Gators Breakdown. And keep that conversation going, Gators Breakdown Plus. Link is in the description there. Uh, look, as we said, many places to keep the conversation going. Gators Breakdown Plus, Gator Collecto, about the uh, about the only two places you need <laughs> to, to go talk Gators uh, and, and find some inside info there. So, um, and then, uh, of course, on, on, on the subscription side uh, of things right there. So, Bob, let's get started. Uh, yeah. Transfer Portal, of course, started last Monday hopping over a thousand players into the transfer portal. Uh, and then for the Gators this past weekend, they get it going through the transfer portal. Uh, we'll talk this recent commitment here of defensive lineman, Caleb Banks, Louisville transfer uh, two years at Louisville. Not a lot of production, eight total games, uh, two as a true freshman in 21, six this past season, two tackles, a sack, a forced fumble, uh, but kind of a unique situation here. Cause since he left high school, He's went from 255 pounds mm -hmm. to 300 pounds. So you can say he's went through a transformation. Maybe that, that part might be why he hasn't been on the field a whole lot, got, kind of going through um, the, the transformation uh, of his body. Six foot seven, 300 pounds from Michigan originally. Uh, and the Gators see him playing multiple roles. It's hard not to see him playing inside as much as possible here. Uh, so, Bob, what, what did the Gators do to wrap this one up so fast? As you know, Caleb also had offers from uh, Southern Cal, Auburn, Oklahoma, and more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and I think what they really like, and you know, he came from that two hundred fifty-five pound range. He, they, he's really athletic, and he can move really well. And you know when you get a kid that only had two tackles, you, you kind of wonder, okay, what is everybody seeing? I mean, what can they, what can they actually see on film? And I think, um, you know, they, they probably got practice film. The kid can take his practice film and the coaches can just see him move. You know, they can see him uh, do all those things. But I think, I think what you get out of him is a guy that uh, certainly at 300 pounds. Now he's going to play interior. Um, but uh Sean Spencer uh, evidently was a guy that just was all over him and just loved his film and, and made him uh, feel like there was no other place he, he wanted to go. And I, I think he was basically won over before he showed up on campus. And then they did a wonderful job when he was here for the official visit. Yeah. So Bob, I mean, is, is the expectation that Banks is going to be a starter next year? Obviously you've got Javon Dexter who's leaving for the pros. You got, you know, Desmond Watson inside, but the defensive line has been thin for years now in, in Gainesville. Is the expectation that Ricks is going to be, or that Banks is going to be a starter pretty much from day one based on what they've seen on film. And, and is that the expectation of the staff bringing him in? Yeah, I, I think that's certainly to be determined. I think that, that they expect him to, to fight for one of those jobs. And, I you know, I really love the way Chris McClellan played this past year uh, as a true freshman. Uh, I don't think he got on the field enough for me personally, but, um, you know, he is a true freshman. He's learning. And, and But from the time I saw him on the field, I thought he did great. So um, I think there's a battle there, and I think they're not done in the portal either. I think they could get a one or two more defensive. They're definitely going to get at least one and maybe two more defensive tackles. And then, 
you know, they're they're in the battle for a couple of elite defensive tackles in recruiting this cycle, and those guys are going to want to be a part of that talk too. Uh, and they have two or three already committed as well. So it's um, I, I think there's going to be some a, a lot of battles going on with guys that probably haven't been in this system yet um, and are all learning. But, uh, you know, I think they're going to increase the talent of that group pretty quickly, especially if they can land a couple of these other guys. Yeah, I think you start there with uh, with your with your spring rotation. <laughs> you go yeah. Watson, McClellan, and now Banks, and there you go. You got some. Mm-hmm. And, and look, you know, there, honestly, we, we know there's not a lot of stats to point to, and look, it's really all based on potential uh, at this point. Bringing that size in, you can't teach that size, uh, so that's, that's that's probably the first thing uh, I think Florida's looking at. But of course, there are, there is no production uh, to point to, so you kind of do just hope that on the potential that he can come in right away uh, and, and lead this group with, I mean, look, he's already been through at least college strength and conditioning programs, been through college football practice has been able to, you know, this is not, not this is not a high school guy. Uh, so you would hope he can hit the ground running uh, in the spring and make his presence felt right away. Uh, talking about big bodies, Bob and Samson, Okanlola, of course, the big highlight mm-hmm. visit this past weekend for the Gators, uh, the five-star offensive lineman. The Gators have pulled out all the stops here on yeah. this recruitment. You know, the, as I mentioned earlier, the custom photo shoots uh, on the unofficial visit previously brought the family this time for the official visit. Uh, the Massachusetts product commits Thursday coming off of this Florida visit. Uh, I know there's some good vibes with this one. He's going to have Miami in house, I believe on Tuesday. That's come out today as well. So, you know, Bob, it, it would give Florida one of the best offensive linemen in this class, and honestly, one of the best they've ever signed. If he was to get, you know, if he was to pledge to the Gators on Thursday, yeah, I think uh, DJ Humphreys and Martez Ivy are probably the guys that were rated higher uh, in in recruiting. Um, you know, when they came out, but that's probably about it. There's not many more, if there are more. So, yeah, big guy. You know, I guess. If you had to question or criticize, it would be the competition he plays. He plays for a small school in Massachusetts, and you know he do- he absolutely dominates everything. But he's a big physical specimen that athletic and and all the things you're looking for, um, and certainly a guy that they are uh, that they are hoping to get. I think they feel pretty good about it. Um, you know, and he, again, he decides on Thursday, but I think they feel pretty good and, uh, would be, just be, you know, if he does commit to Florida, he'll certainly be the highest rated player in the class. So that's a, that's a big deal right there in a, in a pretty good class so far. Bob, just so to let cl- you know, just to let you know how big this one is. This this is like Will's only guy on target. Like this this is Will's guy. The, this is this is the only one Will wants out of the whole class right now. So we can blame him. We can blame him if it doesn't happen. Is that what you're trying to say? Hey, I, I'm I'm fully prepared to eat as many pancakes as is required to bring uh, to bring Okalona. I'll do it on air, Dave. I, I don't care if Okalona commits. Just ask him what he wants. But is that, but, is, that, is, that is that a challenge? Uh, Will and I talk the best behind the scenes. If, if he if he commits to Florida on Thursday, pancake challenge for Will Miles. I don't know that anybody actually wants to see that. We may have to record it and then edit it for, uh, you know, for, for content or something like that. But, well, so I was going to ask Bob, you know, they've, Florida already has Roderick Kearney, Najee Harris, and, mm-hmm. and Bryce Lovett in the in the fold. Obviously, Caden Jones was in town this week as well. Um, is, is Florida prepared to bring in five offensive linemen if they can get those guys to commit? I mean, obviously, you don't say no to Okanola, but are they looking to fill out the class with two more offensive linemen here, or is it sort of an either-or proposition when it comes to the offensive line? You know, this is something I, I, I've thought about, and I haven't gotten a, a straight answer on this, but, you know, we you talked about the transfer portal, and, and – the big part for right now for Florida is how many guys have actually transferred out. And what that has done is it has opened the door for all kinds of, of different options when it comes to taking guys in. And I don't think they're done with guys transferring out. And now maybe that's going to come after the bowl game. Maybe it's going to come after spring. I think some of both, Um, but they're probably six or seven more. I would say more offensive linemen are going to come. So I don't think, I don't think five, six, seven is out of the question. And I think they're going to take a portal or two guys because if you're getting at this level, you know, Florida turning down four-star offensive linemen just 
isn't going to happen or shouldn't happen. And, um, and I, and I, I really think that once they kind of move those guys that I, I shouldn't say move those, once those guys left the squad, I think that, um, it really kind of opens the door for numbers like that. Bob, go, going along with offensive line, and, and Will brought him up, Caden Jones, of course. And look, we don't we don't want to ruin anybody's commitment or anything, but look, this one would be hard pressed to find if he's not committing to Florida. <laughs> I mean, everything's kind of going right uh, in, in this recruitment so far. Six eight, three hundred and five pounds, as Will said, was on campus this past week. Loves the idea of the two fits two offensive line coaches, how they've been able to produce, how they've been able to develop up there up front. Uh, definitely not as highly touted as Oak and Lola, but you know the, the staff has targeted him and kind of bid on him for, for for quite a bit. And it really looks like when he commits uh, at the All American Bowl, it, it, Florida will probably be the pick. Yeah, I think I think that's the case. But you know we've been through crazier things in recruiting, <laughs> and not and this recycle, of course. But um, yeah, I think I think that's the case and. Again, I go back to what I said. If Florida needs offensive linemen, they need they've needed to kind of reshuffle that group. Um, and we've known about the recruiting at, at that at that unit for the last however many years. And um, you know, they're 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 trying to do it and they're trying to do it quickly. So um yeah, I I think I think Caden Jones right now certainly should be uh is favored to come to Florida. And, you know, uh, I just Man, we've been burned a lot, so yeah. it's hard to it's hard to uh, just say anything is a, a lock, so to speak. Not what not that you said that, but it's uh, it's hard to do that these days. Absolutely. After after McLean, I've told myself I'm never giving a ten out of ten. I'm never giving a hundred percent anymore. I, 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 I forget it. Forget about it. Like I've said that before as well. But I think the older I get, I'm going to learn that lesson, and I'll never go a hundred percent anymore. I said that too, and then I I actually put a hundred percent on DJ Lagway, so I won that one. So <laughs> maybe that turns the tide. There we go. Well, you're you're muted, Mill. Whoops, <laughs> I haven't done that in a while. So uh, I I am curious about Okanlona and Jones. Both of those guys not from the state of Florida, yeah. and certainly the offensive line situation. Florida was loaded with talent this year, but the offensive line. Um, position was not as loaded as some of the other positions in the state uh, but how confident is the staff going after these guys who aren't necessarily within the state you know you look at the guys who were in the commits who were in this week this weekend pretty much all of them were from florida that really seems to be where napier's been focusing i think to uh the pleasure of a lot of us seeing that the that the state's a little bit less leaky mm -hmm. but going after these offensive line targets specifically not in the state of florida how confident are they being able to go outside of the state and bring those guys in are you talking about confident in getting them or in in their in uh, grading them or whatever? Well, I'm more confident in just getting them in terms of building those relationships yeah. with these guys who aren't in the state, aren't down the street, can't just pop up for a game, those sorts of things. Well, I think in terms of I think they're both different stories. I think in terms of Jones, you know, they just came from Louisiana as coaches, and I'm no doubt they were on that kid for years, uh, whether he was going to end up at playing at a level uh, of ULL or not, they were recruiting him. So th there's certainly a lot of, uh, you know, the, the relationships going on there. And I think with Samson, the big key, I, I, I and this really hasn't been talked about a lot, but, you know, Jaden Rashada, when he committed, he was pretty much committed to the staff for two or three weeks before that. And, and it mm -hmm. was, if you look at the timeline of, of Samson that he, he kind of said, yeah, I'm going to visit Florida right after, I mean, right, right around that time that, that Rashada was, you know, basically keying in on Florida. And uh, then when Rashada did his thing, Samson came and visited, uh, you know, like undercover uh, until it got out right before. And then, you know, of course, he came back twice, two times in a three week period, quite honestly, and the first one on his own dime. So I think if you look at the relationships they had with Jones and then the Rashada plus all the all the other stuff that's going on with with Samson, I think they they should feel pretty good about it. Again, you know, five star prospect in the terms of, of Samson. I think this NIL thing is, you know, is going to drive coaches crazy, but um, that's the way it goes sometimes. 
Yeah, I think that's the worry of, you know, we, we only had a couple more days uh, uh, until this, but we know with these big names, we've already seen it once, and it hurt the Gators. Uh, we'll see what happens with this five-star uh, right. in, in, in the next couple of days. So we're talking up front, Bob. We're talking offensive linemen. Well, let's go from offensive linemen to running back that, uh, and a running back that these guys may be blocking for uh, here in Mark Fletcher, the four-star from American Heritage. Looks to be another Florida-Miami battle this cycle. Uh, been the thought that Florida – you know, that, that thought has been out there. They want two running backs this cycle. Trayon Webb's in the fold. Early target, Cedric Baxter, Richard Young headed elsewhere. Fletcher has emerged lately. Feel good about this one currently, Bob, like many others, but we have to see if he makes that Miami trip uh, this weekend, uh, if he makes that one or not. There's some talk that he may not end up making that trip, uh, but it is in – it is maybe in the books. Uh, so, as we said, another Florida-Miami battle coming down for a running back right here. <laughs> It's kind of funny because we, we've gone years without battles like that with Miami <laughs> and it, and actually with FSU as well. And yeah. this year, I mean, there's not many battles this year with FSU, a couple of linemen here and there, but nothing, nothing major, honestly. Um, uh, but yeah, you know, I think with Fletcher, um, I think the key here is if you look at his timeline, so he, you know, he actually was visiting different places um, in the South, after being committed to Ohio state, but he decommitted from Ohio state after he visited Florida for the game, mm -hmm. like that week, or maybe a little bit after that. And I think that was really key. I mean, I think that was a tell. I don't necessarily that think it was a key. That was a tell as to what he thought about the Florida experience. Um, he brought a whole bunch of family to that game, by the way, too. So, um, I think that was the South Carolina game, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, so he kind of, if you look at that timeline and just how things changed in his recruitment, um, that was a big deal. And, um, you know, I, 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 that's what I look at. And, and yeah, I think it's absolutely key. Does he make that, that Miami visit this weekend? And, you know, when you got a billionaire throwing around checks, it, it's, it's part of the, the story right now. And, you know, you just you just never know. You just don't. And and I think it is key. If it, if he makes that Miami visit, then we'll have to see what goes on. We'll have to you know, we might have to change the way we look at that one. Yeah, I mean, does Florida really feel like they need I mean, I know, Dave, you mentioned Trey on Webb in the fold. It, does Napier believe they need two running backs every cycle? Um, you know, obviously Florida's had some difficulty recruiting at the running back position over the last few years, bringing in guys like Bowman and Lingard and stuff like that through the transfer portal. Um, is that, you know, obviously the two offensive line coaches and emphasis on offensive line and defensive line recruiting um, is running back. Should we expect to see two running backs in the fold for the most part in, in these classes moving forward, just because of the way Napier wants to run his offense? I think it has totally to do with, number of running backs on the roster and I honestly think the number should be five I've been over my I started watching Gator football in 1985 I mean that's when I went to school started school in 85 and I've gone continuously through there I've been through seasons at Florida where they've gone through the to the fourth back I mean, literally, the fourth back was the starter because of injuries. And so I believe actually five should be the number because you definitely want to have a backup to whoever starts, you know. And so um, I don't think you'd want to necessarily – you know, you'd hope you'd have a redshirt senior, a, a redshirt junior, a redshirt – you know, that's what you'd kind of hope you had one in every class. But I think you need to get your roster to five. And, and they're probably not going to do it this time around. They'll probably do four. Um, but I think next year, um, you know, you would imagine if Montreal has another good season, he might be gone after next year. And then you probably, I think, bring in two and they've already got one committed. So I think, uh, you know, trying to add one more is probably most likely. I think, I think the number, the deal is you want five on your roster. They're not going to be quite there this year, but I think they'll get there. Yeah, they may be. If Montreal does leave, they may be on a cycle where they just kind of have to take two. It may just kind of happen that way. Uh, yeah, <laughs> for, for, yeah, because you figure, yeah, because you figure Trevor's probably yeah. not far behind doing that. So, yeah, I, again, I think it's it's just about number on the roster. You got to have a, the right number. And I think, you know, they always coaches always talk about the guys closest to the ball. Um, are the ones that are hardest to 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 learn the offense. Now, 
that doesn't really count running backs, even though they're <laughs> pretty close. It, it's, you know, it's the quarterbacks and the offensive linemen. And on the other side of the ball is the defensive linemen. So, but, but running backs are quicker to get on the field. And so I think you can, you know, you, you can, you don't have to bring in a, a transfer. I think you can bring in a really talented freshman and get away with it. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So we got more with Bob, but before we do, let's get to some messages here by our sponsors. Of course, my bookie, your favorite athletes always strive to put themselves in a winning position, and it's about time you did too with my bookie. My bookie has the biggest online selection of odds and contests to fill all your sports betting needs anytime, anywhere. Bet on the NFL. In regular seasons, counting down all these games in these NFL teams, a lot of desperation in the NFL. So, hey, good bet on that desperation. Bowl season coming up right here for college football. Plenty of more college football games to get some money in on before we call this season quits or play for a share of big cash prizes in the weekly blackjack tournaments. Sign up at MyBookie, use promo code Gators on a deposit of $500 or more, and you can claim a bonus of up to $200. Again, that's promo code Gators to claim a brand new deposit bonus designed for betters looking to get their cash in and cash out quick. Experience sports in a whole new light and make this season a winning one. Bet anything, anytime, anywhere with MyBookie. You know the goosebumps you get when Florida takes the field? Or when that 63-yard Hail Mary actually works? Or the thrill of a game-winning interception in the end zone? What a rush. You can experience that same rush every day at your home with Shark Coatings. We'll cover your old, ugly concrete with a beautiful industrial concrete coating and a warranty that lasts longer than most careers in professional football. So whether your garage floor is for parking, partying, or working out, Shark Coatings can transform it. And if your pool deck is starting to look like a bulldog, old, cracked, and smells like pee, Shark Coatings can transform that too. Shark Coatings is easy to clean, stain resistant, and is 100% antibacterial and antimicrobial. We're easy on the eyes and on the maintenance. Gator Nation is worldwide, and Shark Coatings is based right in the heart of it. So whether you live in Brunswick, Georgia, or Live Oak, Florida, down to Ocala, over to New Smyrna Beach, or anywhere in between, Contact us for a free estimate today. Learn more at sharkfloorcoatings.com. That's sharkfloorcoatings.com. All right, here we are back right here on Gators Breakdown, of course. Join Will and Bob right here. And Bob, let's get into uh, one more who's been on campus a lot in the last few months. That is defensive tackle, defensive lineman, four-star John Walker over and over again. The all fall, all these games. Last visit was to you know probably just try and seal the deal, mostly with the parents. Uh, depth charts friendly, of course, for the UCF commit. There's not much more Florida can really do. They've probably got to get the parents on board with this one. Yeah, and and I'll be honest with you, this one is just perplexing to me why it hasn't happened. We keep hearing, you know, behind the scenes, and everybody pretty much out there knows that this one's supposed to pop, uh, flip. And for whatever reason, it just hasn't yet. So, you know, that, I, again, I thought, okay, he's going to come here. He's going to visit with the family. Everything's going to be good. And then they're going to, he's, he's going to go home Sunday and call everybody and tell them he's, he's committed. So, um, and it, and it hasn't happened. So I don't, I, I believe it will. Um, I think everybody else believes it will. Um, but uh, it hasn't yet. And, and honestly, this one is really perplexing to me. I know distance is the issue. I, I know that is is what it is, and you know, Bob sounds kind of crazy. Sounds kind of crazy being from Orlando, right? And, and, and proximity being an issue, right? And if you're on I four, it might take you longer to get there than it does, you know. I mean, so it just, it, you know, all that's relative. But you know, I don't, I, I don't know what, I don't know what's holding it up. Let's put it that way. And so, um, I, I feel like it's going to happen. It's just one of those things that just hasn't happened yet. So we'll, we'll have to see. Big well, time, I mean, again, prospect. big time prospect. Yeah. So, so what is it about him that, that Florida likes so much? I mean, obviously, you know, from a star ranking and all that sort of stuff, he's pretty high up there, but you know, yeah. you talked about banks and they like him specifically for his athleticism. What is it about Walker that they look at and say, okay, this is what we're getting when we bring this guy in. I think it's the same thing, but you take banks and you add 20 pounds and, and he's a playmaker. He he's uh, fast. He's physical. Um, he makes a lot of plays as a defensive tackle in, and plays really strong, uh, you know, in a, a classification of football, pretty strong. So 
Um, I just, I just think he's, uh, you know, he's, he, he, I think he'd be the highest rated one they got if they get him. So um, he's up there with, with big baby uh, Jordan Hall. And uh, I think he's actually rated a little bit higher if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Anyway, uh, being an athletic man, it's, it's, it's what he brings to the table. And another, just right down the road, right in Orlando area, you know, (laughs) Florida's, you know, we we know the in-state and how much better Florida's got to do there given the history. And as Will said earlier, off to a good start in in Billy Napier's class here can add to it there uh, with John Walker. So, uh, going out of state again, Bob, and maybe another flip candidate tied in. Jaden Platt currently committed to Stanford. Texas A&M was thought to be a major player here. Now there's some question of actually if he'll visit Texas A&M this weekend as originally planned, or he may even go visit that new staff at Stanford I'm hearing uh, uh, today. So we'll see where that one goes. But Florida did an outstanding job this past weekend. Uh, can you share what Florida did so well here in, uh, in, in this one? Because, I mean, there were some really rave reviews for this Stanford commit coming out of this visit and, you know, Florida find, maybe finding another tight end. Yeah. Well, first of all, let me say this. I have, I have a handful of, of Florida uh, diehard Florida Gator fans that would tell you that if you have an, uh, an option to go to Stanford, you, you take that option. So it's a tough, it's tough not to go there. It really is regardless of who the coach is because of, of how you get set up after, you know, after you graduate. But that being said, um, you know, we teased this one a bit when we heard that it was, he was coming. We didn't quite say who he was or even what position, just that we knew, you know, we had heard that he was coming and then, and then he shows up and he has a great time. Now he came, he was on crutches the whole time. So they had to cart him around in a cart and, uh, but they, they made sure they took care of him. That was one of the questions I asked, you know, what happens to like players? Um, do, and, and, and what I heard was with the new staff and all the people they have is when a player ends up in a boot or is on crutches or something, they actually have a staff member that will drive them to their classes. So certainly I never had anything like that when I went to school. In Florida. But um, anyway, uh, yeah, I mean, again, I think a, a, a kid like that, Stanford is a big deal. It is. I mean, when you when you can get into Stanford and go there, it is a big deal. And I'm not knocking Florida's education at all. It's just that Stanford's just way up there uh, with them, and and a lot of people do it because it is Stanford, uh, the school, not necessarily a football program. And anyway, so likes Florida. Yeah, the Texas A&M visit. We'll see. I, I you know, I he's from Texas. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I know he really likes them as well. Um, but it would be pretty interesting if he actually went back and visited Stanford again. I, I, again, you know, I have really diehard Gator fan friends that would not knock him one bit if he, if he decided to go to that school. Yeah. I mean, and obviously tight ends a position of need given what Napier wants yep. to do with that position. Mm-hmm. Um, so from the standpoint of this class, no tight ends committed yet. I'm sure that's probably a, something that they're telling him, at least in terms of the ability to get early playing time. And, and, you know, I'm assuming they're, they're targeting people in the transfer portal at that position as well. But, but Platt would probably be sort of the crown jewel at the tight end position for this cycle, I would assume. Yeah. And I think they have a couple in the next class that they that feel really good about possibly getting to as well. And, you know, I think they came into the recruiting process this year with a number of guys at the position and then they moved a couple of guys over there as well. So they thought they might, you know, figure out a, a diamond in the rough, if you will. Um, and that kind of never materialized. Um, and also I'll tell you what, Arliss Boardingham is, is going to be really good. Uh, and he he missed all year with injury, and he's a guy that they feel is going to be extremely good, ex- really athletic at the position, um, and they so they really like him. But you know, it, Tony Livingston's another one that's gray shirt going to come in uh, in the off season as well. So they they they've got some, they still have some guys there, and I think they're going to probably lose one or two more before fall starts, but. Um, yeah, I think the opportunity is definitely there. I just think when they set out to start this class, they just weren't – they had one or two main big-time targets, and he was actually one of them, um, but he committed to Stanford and, um, you know, it was out of the picture. Um, but when they weren't going to get those one or two guys 
or him, I think they kind of just said, okay, well, we're good. We'll just figure it out next year. And again, I think they got it lined up for next year. Um, well, a couple of guys that they, they can, uh, you know, they feel pretty good about. Bob, we'll stick with this weekend here. Jakeem Jackson, he's committed. Uh, it's pretty yep. much, and and off of this off of this visit has done. And now it seems like he has shut down his recruitment. As Miami's kind of been trying to come on hot and heavy the last few weeks, uh, maybe to try to get a visit, maybe to try to get a flip uh, from Florida to Miami. But Jakeem Jackson, pretty much today, has come out and said, "Not a visit's not happening." Uh, he's going to, of course, shut it down uh, and stick with the Gators and. Look, um, look, they got Cormani over Florida, but you know they've been after Dijon Johnson. They've been after mm-hmm. Sharif Denson uh, as well. But those defensive backs all on campus this week locked into Florida. Yeah, I think, I think those guys. You know, maybe, maybe Ruiz, the 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 billionaire down there, wants to write him a big check. But I think these guys need to realize, you know, how good they are. If they are that good, and they think they're that good, who's going to coach them? And I think for Jakeem, that realization hit him up pretty hard. And, you know, w- when you have uh, Corey Raymond coaching you up, you, there's every school in the country would like Corey Raymond coaching their cornerbacks. I can tell you that right now. So I think that's a huge deal. And I think w- with these guys, that's the kind of thing that won him over. You know, it, it's so weird because I think because of the Cormani thing, every little thing that comes up about Miami – they're, you know, people get skittish about. But I'll tell you what, when Florida flipped Rashada, they're the same way about Florida on everything. So, you know, there was this rumor that Malik Bryant yeah. showed up in Gainesville this weekend and all the Miami fans or a lot of Miami fans were freaking. He never showed up, you know. So, I mean, th- it's going to go both ways for a while. It's it's really kind of been a an interesting um, deal. <laughs> I don't know what else to call it. Yeah, Bob, I think I saw an article somewhere, is it yesterday or this week, and it was talking about Florida and Miami, and it was NIL powerhouses. <laughs> so when, 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 discuss, when discussing the relationship between the two. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's pretty fair. I think, you know, I don't th- necessarily think Florida has the best or Miami has the best with their guy, but I think there's certainly two of the best. And, you know, they happen to be five hours apart and going for a lot of the same kids. So, um, you know, it's – it's funny. I mean, you know, Cormani was a local kid, but you know, Rashad is all the way from California and the two schools are fighting over that. And then a pancake man in, in Massachusetts, they're fighting over that one too, you know? So it's, it's not just necessarily guys between here and Miami they're fighting about. It's guys from all over the country, which is, you know what? It, one thing, one thing about Napier and a year in, him coming on in last December is that it it occurred to me right then and there that Florida football is going to be fun for 12 months out of the year now, instead of possibly three. (laughs) And cause it's been, it's just been brutal for eight or nine months out of the year because of all, all the recruiting battle losses. And now whether they win all these battles that, you know, the core mines are going to happen. There's still going to be fun recruiting times uh, with Florida because he's got a hundred people working for him one. And he's got, now he's got money and with the NIL and all that and a new facility and all these other things, it's all like crammed into one thing at the same time. I just think to me, it's going to be such a, breath of air for 12 months now instead of just trying to you know just trying to hope you win enough games between september and december to haul in a good class that would those days hopefully are over for for quite a long time because that's where we've been for seven years at least bob you're preaching to the choir you're preaching to the yeah, choir i know, Amen, I, know, I, know, I, know I know it i know it i know it <clears throat> Well, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned with Jackson and Denson and Johnson, you know, looking at Corey Raymond and saying, hey, this is where we want to be, even, you know, assuming I'm going to assume the NIL money is at least close to equivalent for for both of those locations. But, but you know, you mentioned Rashada as well, and then you've got Lagway committing in 2024. How much has that sort of impacted the excitement and the – the commitments of these guys who've already committed to the program. And now you have these other guys, the big time guys at the quarterback position committing. Has that really sort of added to momentum? And are you hearing from these guys that, that that's making a difference in terms of what they're able to sell when they talk to other guys outside of the program? 
Yeah, I mean, did you? I, I don't know if you. I'm. You guys are on Twitter all the time. So the the, the tweet between was it Jeremiah Smith and mm-hmm. then uh, uh, to to Lagway to and Lagway. then Lagway. You know, I mean, the number one receiver in the country, right? And everybody has him actually pegged to Ohio State. At least I do. But he's from Miami, and so Miami is probably going to be in the mix as well. And then he's hitting up the quarterback that just committed to Florida. That's in the same class. I mean, that's that's a pretty big deal to me. And um, yeah, I absolutely. And that was one thing when we, when we started figuring out that Lagway was probably coming, um, I kept thinking and kept saying, you know, getting this guy this early, there has not been a quarterback committed to Florida before April of their signing day. Uh, There's not, there has not been one, uh, committed to Florida at least since, oh my gosh, uh, I, I can't even tell you. Back in in the 1990s, maybe. Um, I know, I know, all the way back to um, uh, Driscoll was April. He was the earliest since uh, I believe uh, Meyer took over because Tebow was December, mm-hmm. like two months before. Uh, Chris Leak was December because he did it in an All Star game. Yep. Uh, I mean, all those guys, and and you know, you could still do a lot of that. I mean, Leak was very instrumental in bringing in Bubba Caldwell and Chad Jackson right back then, who were the number one and two receivers in the country. That's what I think you can get from Lagway, but he's got a whole year before the early signing day to do this, and he's and not only that, but he's all over it and. And you know, props to Rashada too. He's not laying back and letting the coaches do it. He's he's jumping in too and trying to get the the current class, and he's helping with the next class as well. So, I, I mean, I, I this is a position we haven't been in. I honestly can't remember the last quarterback that was, you know, we there haven't been that many this highly rated um, for either of them actually that um, that was committed this early. I can't, I can't remember when that would be. And, and I don't think the records go back that far for me to actually look them up, not online anyway, but um, I know uh, all the way back to Chris Leak, that wasn't the case. Yeah, Bob, that brings up a, a point I brought up on the, the lagway commitment episode is if you go back, I mean, Florida's already got a pretty good wide receiver class this time, mm-hmm. you know, for this, for this 23 class. And they were pretty much working with, you know, Stokes who committed in the summer, they didn't get Rashad until, what, a month ago. So they were already being able to put together a pretty good wide receiver class without really much to point to at the quarterback position. And now you got a five-star quarterback to now tag along with going out there and, and, and recruiting wide receivers. Okay. Well, yeah, I, I, I just think that they will, uh, you know, they will um... – I do think – I think it's going to help. I, I really do. And, I, you know, it helps when the offense looks good and does its thing. It, it certainly helps. But, um, you know, it's uh, – it, it's. I think getting him on board this early is such a huge thing. Yeah. I'll wrap it up right here with you, Bob, and maybe Will's got one more. But let's go back to last weekend. Uh, these visits started. Jordan Hall, defensive lineman out of here in Jacksonville. He visited mm-hmm. – uh, cornerback Desmond Ricks visited last weekend as well. Um, once again, word coming out of those visits, very good for those two prospects there for the Gators, but some powerhouses uh, got involved, of course, uh, and now they visited this past weekend. Hall visited Georgia, the school thought to be you know the leader lately for his recruitment. Ricks visited the Crimson Tide, LSU up next. You know, Florida nailed the visits last week. Hopefully that can carry over until – you know, we get those commitments. Uh, both of those guys, oddly enough, are going to commit next Thursday, not next Wednesday when everybody else is making their commitments. They're going to wait a day, uh, commit December 22nd. So they visited last weekend together. Maybe, maybe they'll commit together <laughs> on December 22nd, not the 21st. Yeah, and I think it's, again, you know, I think the general vibe is good for both. But you had Rick's visit Alabama this past weekend, and they got LSU. And I'll say this, and I've said it on on the boards, that LSU, um, I think if all things were equal, I think that for whatever place that program is the one he would want to go to. But I think Florida offers a better package for him. It's the coach. It's probably NIL eventually. 
it's it's the the new facilities it's all that stuff but i think if all things were equal i for whatever reason i thought i think lsu would be the school and he is visiting them last so that's something to look at and then the other thing uh with, with jordan hall um you know i think you know florida offered his uh brother a um a walk on and uh a preferred walk on status and you know, that's not the be all end all, but it was, I think it was a big deal for them. And of course, you know, Georgia is the team to beat there, I guess. And uh, they could do the same, but as I tell people, and, and again, you know, I, I think the vibes are really good for Florida right now, but knowing this is recruiting and anything can happen. But um, I think that the, the fact that Florida is 75 miles away and that the, the, the family can, can come, could come and see both brothers at the same time. I think that's a big deal. You know, Georgia could whatever arrange for getting them to, to Athens back and forth, you know, however, mm -hmm. I guess would be a plane, which wouldn't be legal, but whatever they, something could happen there. Um, they could probably do that through NIL now, actually. But anyway, um, but it's, it's, it's a lot different being able to hop in your car and drive in, you know, an hour and 15 minutes down the road than it is waiting on a plane or waiting ever to get, to get to Athens. So I think that's a big deal. Um, and I think it was a big deal to their family when it happened. Um, and I think, you know, everything else they like, you got a couple, you know, got a couple of Jacksonville kids also committed in the, in the class. I think that's another big deal. And those guys are working on them. So, uh, we'll see. Uh, I think good vibes, and and we'll see what happens. Anything else, Will? Wrap it up. I, I guess, you know, you're not really in the prediction business, but Ricks and, and Oak and Lola obviously are the big guys here. You think Florida goes two for two, one for two, or, or 0 for two, Bob? I I, I think Ricks is, is uh, a much easier pick, honestly. Um. You know, I think I think he really liked Florida for a while, um, and they it, it it was one of those things where they really didn't want him to class, reclassify, and didn't want him to reclassify because they were they they thought they were getting Cormani, and they had a full class, and they wanted him to wait a year. Um, but then when they missed, it was a it was like a, a perfect thing, right? That he actually reclassified. Requ uh, requ uh, so um, I think. Even though I think LSU is for what I don't honestly know what it is, but there's something about LSU that he really likes. Um, I think I think even though that I think all the other intangibles uh, make that one a set. And I honestly I'm I'm I, I think the vibes are there for for Samson Okanola, uh, but I'm not ready to say that one's going to happen. So we'll, we'll see. We'll see. I, I, I again, the vibes are good, but I, you know, too many. You know, it's just it, it was kind of a, a I don't know that one to no, me. I, I feel you like you know, we got the good vibes and, and, and the good pick from Lagway last week, but now it's time to start stacking. You know, stacking those big time guys, and then of you'll course, start. Of course, of course, and you know, we there's not a five star in this class yet either. Uh, so one, those would be the two, right? So. Yep. So get I, I just give me I mean I want you know as a Gator guy we want both of them of course, uh, but I think it was I think it's key getting that first one I think it is and so whichever one it is, you know so be it I I I think uh, I, you know we'll we'll see. Hey Bob, uh, thank you so much, man, for for joining right here on Gators Breakdown. Everybody, you can get Bob's insight there at the Gator Collective uh, message board. Join Gator Collective first. Help these uh, student athletes out in the NIL. Believe me, it's going to go a long way in, in returning Florida back to uh, yeah. uh, you know the, the elite status of college football. And we we know this new age of college football is going to come down to NIL a lot. Uh, but you can get some extra benefits there with Bob on the the Gator Collective board. All right, appreciate it, guys. All Thanks, right. Bob. Thanks, Bob. Yep. All right. We'll uh we'll wrap up some uh first of all, let's keep it on recruiting just for a second before we move ahead just quickly for the bowl game uh versus Oregon State. I got a big preview coming up this week. I'm sure you do too at Reading Reaction. Uh, but hey, this is the first time you and I have gotten together 
in a public setting since the big commitment of DJ Lagway uh, to the Gators last week. So uh, and we look, we kind of alluded to it there. We let Bob uh, go on his thoughts about that, but you know, us together. Look, this was one. Uh, of course, we've all been waiting on that, that type of commitment, that type of recruitment. I know you had a big uh, look at it in uh, an article there at Read and Reaction. So, guys, if you haven't done so yet, go read Will's thoughts on getting uh, this big time quarterback. Look, I know it's a year away, uh, and we, you know, we'll be talking about him hopefully uh, this time a year from now and uh, put together this twenty four class. Uh, but well, this this one's big enough. Look, and I and I said it, and I've said it plenty of times. I don't turn the page most of the time from twenty three to twenty four, or from one class to the next class. But this one, this one was big. It can't be it can't be overstated, and it cannot be hit home enough. This one's big. Yeah, I mean it's 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 not a we're not breaking news here when we say that the quarterback position is the most important position on the field. And Billy Napier now has two of the top nine guys who've ever been signed since 2000 um, at the quarterback position, right? So, and Lagway is up there in a grouping with Chris Leak, Tim Tebow, Jeff Driscoll, DJ Lagway, and Cam Newton as the top five guys that Florida's signed since 2000. You get to the next five, then you got John Brantley, Gavin Dickey, Will Greer, Jaden Rashada, and Felipe Franks. And quite honestly, that kind of meshes with where those guys' probabilities fit in terms of being successful, right? Franks was good, not great, and was awful in 2017. But other than that, when he when he when he was fully prepared, was good. Greer had a possibility had was possibly to be, you know, possibly could have been good. Dickey, eh, not so much. John Brantley, not so much. So, you know, th there's some boom or bust there in the Rashada range, and we knew that coming in, but it's still important to sign those guys. There's like a one in eight shot that a guy like that's going to be a star. For Lagway, it's like one in three. And and that's what you're getting is you you know every time you bring in a recruit it's a lottery ticket on whether that guy's going to turn into a superstar. It's one of the reasons why it's awesome that Florida's bringing in like 17 defensive linemen in, in this mm -hmm. 2023 class because two of them are going to turn into stars. We're going to have a, a just a vicious defensive line at some point because they brought in so many defensive linemen, regardless of who it is. Right? We can talk about Jordan Hall. We can talk about Banks. We can talk about Walker. We can talk about the guys they've already got in the fold. But somebody's going to turn into some. Somebody's going to turn into just a beast up front but i think that's sort of what you're looking at that they're stacking at the quarterback position right rashada may turn into a star he may not but now you've got that lottery ticket with rashada in 2023 you've got a big time lottery ticket with lagway in 2024 we'll see what happens in 2025 in terms of being able to bring in a quarterback prospect but you look at like even the way the the argument against sort of mullins mullins recruiting was always well you know look at how clemson did it but the 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 gap in that thinking was always that, well, Clemson had Taj Boyd, Deshaun Watson, and Trevor Lawrence basically back to back to back. And it turns out when you have a quarter and the year they had Kelly Bryant, you know, the offense was struggling and they wound up having to replace him with Trevor Lawrence at some point along the way. And you're going to have to build programs through the quarterback position. And and the fact that Napier has brought in two of the top nine since since 2000, I think, says he realizes that, he recognizes it, he's prioritizing it. And Florida's got some really, really good players coming in at that position. And it's going to be nice to not have to wonder, is this guy going to be able to develop into a prospect, right? I mean, with Anthony Richardson this year, the skills were all there, but he needed to develop and needed to become seasoned and all that sort of stuff. I think Lagway is going to come in and be able to play right from right from the jump. And the question is going to be, has Rashada already taken the position? Right. <laughs> or, or is Lagway <laughs> going to come in and play right away just because, you know, hey, Rashada struggled for a little bit as a true freshman, and now Lagway comes in and is able to win the job. That's the question. But yeah. that's great, right? Because then you have Rashada, you have Lagway, you have anybody who's been brought in through the transfer portal. You know, there's been all sorts of names from the NC State quarterback to Grayson McCall entered the transfer portal today, those sorts of things. So you're going to potentially have an opportunity to bring in somebody from the portal, sort of hold things down. But then you're going to have young guys who have three years of eligibility fighting, three years minimum of eligibility fighting for that position and really built, bringing stability to that position in a way that we haven't seen in games in a really long time. I mean, if you look at the guys – at the quarterback position and just sort of go back to 2000 and start naming off the quarterbacks. I mean, you got Tim Tebow and Chris Leak, but other than that, it's sort of a, a just a list of disappointments all the way through, except for maybe Kyle Trask, and he's not somebody that you would have expected to be a star to begin with. And it's great when you hit on that guy, but it's a whole lot better if you get three years out of the guy you throw in there day one as a starter rather than having to wait until there's an injury to bring in your red shirt junior to come in and save the day. And uh, and that's what we're getting with Lagway. We're getting a guy, high, high pedigree, somebody who should be able to jump in day one at the most important position on the field. And as Bob said, going to be able to recruit with a year and a half 
you know, sitting there until his yeah. signing day comes and say, Hey, don't you want to come play with DJ Lagway? Look at what we're building here. And Hey, even if Lagway doesn't work out, look at who we've got behind him in Rashada. Right. So there's, there's not no wide receiver is going to be able to look at this and say, I'm not going to have somebody who can get me the ball. And quite honestly, that's, that's been a question at Florida for the last yeah. decade at this point. Right. And I mean, living through the lean years where we had, uh, you know, Brett Pease is the, as the offensive coordinator and Charlie Weiss. And, and then you got Nussmeyer as the offensive coordinator for all those years. And Tyler finally Murphy, Mullen- Treon Harris, Alston Appleby, Luke Del Rio. I mean, we got to keep going, right? I mean, you know, if, if you want more of those guys, I'm fine with it, Dave, but I'm going to stick with Lagway and Rashad and ride, <laughs> ride with those guys. Uh, that, that, that's another thing. Look, we know it's a year away. Um, and look, there is a lot that can happen. There were a lot of eyes on this commitment. So believe me, Will and I have gotten thrown in our face a little bit. That's a year away. Probably won't even stick. He probably won't even commit. Well, Will kind of spoke to that too. He can still help build a class even if something happens. But here's the thing. There were so many eyes on that one. If he didn't commit to Florida, you know how many of those same people would have said, well, yep, see, told you he couldn't hit the big one. Or, <laughs> so, or, or yeah, this continuing the same way. No, nothing's changed. Okay, well, you know, this signals some kind of change. Of course, he still has to sign. He still has to end up in the class. But the same ones saying, well, we'll see what happens, would have also been the same ones slamming him for not getting him in the first place. Well, I think it's even more than that. With with Lagway in the fold, you now have two guys in the top 30. And so, you know, you start thinking about guy with Miles for the, Graham. For the class of 24, yeah. For the class of 24. And then you got Chauncey Bowens, who's a top 300 guy at the running back position that Bob mentioned earlier. So – the class already has the elite talent, assuming these guys stick, that none of the other classes so far under Napier have had. And so if all he does is take the class in 2024 as it currently sits and fills it out with almost exactly what the 2023 class has right now, we're going to be talking about a top three class, right? And that's the excitement is you don't have to wonder, oh, is that five star or almost five star because Miles Graham's still listed as a four on the composite. But is the is the five star guy going to commit he already has and it's the quarterback right it's the most important position on the field who's done it and yeah you know maybe maybe one of these guys sticks maybe he doesn't i mean all that sort of stuff it doesn't matter to me you've now put a stake in the sand and said hey we're going to recruit at an elite level 2024 is the start you know hey maybe we missed on cormani mclean maybe we won't be able to bring in rick's rock and lola that'll be disappointing there's no doubt about that but from the standpoint of being able to bring in an elite class in 2024, I think you're already sort of pointing towards that. So look, I mean, he's got to get the job done. Right. Mm-hmm. And like you said, it's, 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 you know, it's more than a year away before we're going to be actually having these guys sign on the dotted line. And look, Napier can't just sit there and say, well, he committed, so we're not going to pay any attention to him anymore. Obviously, they're going to have to still pay attention to him. They're going to have to make sure the NIL deals work right. They're going to have to make sure that, you know, the that O'Hara is in contact with him as the quarterback coach and all that sort of stuff. But out of all the things that Napier may struggle with, having an organizational structure that is able to reach out to recruits and make sure that they feel communicated to is not one of them. Right. Like from all of the things that that he's come in and brought to the organization, the ability to communicate, to build relationships, I think, is probably one of the strongest things that he brings. And so the idea that somebody's just going to decommit for no reason. I mean, look, Lagway committed for a reason. Yeah. I think lag. I think they pushed. I, I don't have inside information on this. You may. But I bet you that they pushed to have him commit early because they know how important it is to be able to have that that core building block sitting there in that 2024 class so that no one can say, well, who's going to throw the ball to you to the wide receivers, right? So that no one can say, well, you know, you're not going to be able to win a championship there at Florida. They don't have a good quarterback. Like at this point, there is no negative recruiting you can make towards the Florida program, at least not at the quarterback position. And, you know, given all of the bodies that are leaving through the transfer portal and, you know, Bob saying, geez, they're going to bring in 27, 28, 29 signees in the 2023 class. Well, now you're going to have a lot of youth all coming in at one time and a quarterback sort of hitting at the right time. I, I think uh, in in many ways, um, you know, we always talk about the bump class. I think the bump class is really, really critical. And I think we're going to look at this and there's going to be some good and some bad when, when the dust settles in the end for this particular bump class. But I also think that uh, just the getting the running start to 2024 is going to silence a lot of the criticism towards that. And I think rightfully so. I mean, the reality is if this was a cornerback, I'd be saying, eh, it's a big deal, but come on, we need to do more in 2023. The fact that it's a quarterback makes me go, all right, I'm good with it. <laughs> like five-star quarterback <laughs> coming in a year from now. I'm willing to wait. I'm willing to be patient to see DJ Lagway play ball. 
All right, Will. Let's wrap it up quickly. Uh, hey, what do you want to see versus uh, Oregon State? Saturday, Las Vegas Bowl for the Gators. Um, of course, we don't know who's going to be playing. Billy Napier did say in a press conference last week that some of the transfers would play uh, in, in this bowl game. He did not give names, but we do know Anthony Richardson will not be the quarterback. We know Jack Miller is going to be the quarterback for the Gators. Uh, Cyrus Torrance is not going to play. Uh, Richard Garage declared for the draft today. Um, and not really officially, but he's going to play in the Reese Senior Bowl. So that's pretty all the indication we need there. Uh, did not nothing's there about if he's going to play in the bowl game or not either. So you know we'll see when Florida if they hand out a depth chart sometime this week. We don't really know with this bowl game. I know they they leave on Tuesday. They'll be in Las Vegas on Tuesday. Uh, but we'll not knowing totally who's going to play for the Gators. We know who's going to play quarterback. We know the running backs will be there. Uh, Cyrus Torrance not going to play. Maybe Richard Garage not going to play. Uh, there, so we might get our first glimpse of maybe next year's offensive line uh, a little bit. Aguacon uh, at center, um, then maybe maybe Michael Tarquin at right tackle, Austin Barber left tackle, uh, maybe Ethan White left guard. Uh, so you know we'll see what happens there at right guard uh, with, with this. But kind of look, looking, peeking ahead, we might get a preview of what we'll see in the spring. Maybe see, see next fall uh, there for the Gators, but. Jack Miller taking the reins at quarterback. Uh, we'll see what happens with defense with all the, the transfers on that side of the ball. Uh, Ventro Miller not going to play uh, in, in the game. But, Will, we don't know who's going to be out there, but what do you want to see from these Gators on Saturday? Yeah, I mean, I think obviously everybody probably wants to see what Jack Miller's got. Yeah. Um, he was the guy that we looked at, and when Richardson was struggling, said, oh, good goodness, get back in the fold so that Richardson can run a little bit more. And, you know, obviously it took him a little bit longer to get back to to where he needed to be. I think Napier said he couldn't throw until like three or four weeks ago. Mm -hmm. It wasn't cleared to throw. So um, getting him in the fold, understanding what we have, and in many ways, then understanding what we need, right? Is is he going to be a game manager? Or is he somebody who's going to jump in and be able to hit some of the throws that maybe Richardson couldn't, right? And I think that's going to be the thing, is he's going to hit some stuff Anthony Richardson couldn't, and he's going to not be able to do some things Anthony Richardson could do. And so you're definitely giving up some explosiveness, hopefully for consistency. If he can't be consistent, then obviously Florida's going to struggle. And then, you know, look, Napier said earlier, coming out of fall camp, that he was comfortable eight or nine deep on the offensive line. And so with Osiris Torrance leaving, with Garage potentially leaving, um, you know, you, and and potentially not playing, now you got to start figuring out, are you, you know, how truthful is that, right? And that's one of the things, you know, I've been excited to see Cameron Waits play. I've been excited to see, I thought Ethan White played really well this year. He made second team SEC in a couple of, in a couple of these places. So look, Florida is not chopped liver there on the offensive line. And they have been a very, very effective team running the ball all year. And they're going to have to rely on that. And so can they run the ball with just the running backs without the threat of Anthony Richardson at quarterback? I think it's one of the other questions. And then and then the third question that I'll, that I'll pose is, you know, look, here's the deal. I, I think Oregon State is a, is a good team, but Ben Goldbrinson is not, is not lights out at the quarterback position. And the question I have is, are they going to make him look like they made uh, and he's also not all that mobile. So with him not being all that mobile, are the defensive ends going to be able to get in there and terrorize him and, and really get pressure? Cause they've started human Milan and, and Powell Ryland have started to get some pressure recently. They were able to do it against Florida state. They just couldn't close the deal. Couldn't tackle, yeah. <laughs> and the question is, are they going to be able to close the deal against a guy like Goldbrinson? Because, you know, Look, I, Oregon State did not put a lot of pressure on the quarterback this year. They had uh, they had 60 total tackles for loss and 16 sacks. And by comparison, Florida had 67 tackles for loss and 21 sacks. So Florida caused more havoc than Oregon State did. And yes, Oregon State gave up less points, but a lot of that had to do with their ability to, to stop the run. And look, they only gave up 6.3 yards per pass. So on the backside, they're okay. But look, if, if Jack Miller's not getting pressured, is he going to be able to find holes in the zone? Is he going to be able to do some things that's, especially if Florida can run the ball to take advantage of it. And then on the other side, is Florida going to be able to get to the quarterback? Those are sort of the two things that I'm looking at, looking for. Again, I think if Florida loses this game, we're not going to take a whole lot out of it other than, hey, welcome, Jaden Rashada. It's good to have you here. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and it'll be good to have, um, you know, big time offensive linemen if they can bring them in too in the recruiting class. But, um, you know, this is also one of those, they've had an opportunity to practice for a couple of weeks. 
And yeah, I think Nick be- said uh, about seven or eight practices they'll get in before they go to before they get to the before they get to the game on Saturday. Well, and they know who's going to the transfer portal, and so there's going to be some young guys I'm sure that we see on defense. You know, Bob mentioned McClellan. I think that's one of the guys you're going to see slide in there and play quite a bit. Um, so we're going to see sort of a youth movement here too. And and hey, look, Dex- defense- Dexter is play though, so that's good. No, that's I mean, we'll, we'll see his last game uh, there Saturday. Well, and and the defense can't be much worse than it has been. And so, you know, with seven practices, what have they been able to do, not just preparing for Oregon State, but what have they been able to do to sort of instill some of the the toughness and instill some of the consistency that's necessary? You don't get an opportunity to have seven or eight straight practices and work on stuff all year long, right? You get the bye week, but even then you're sort of recovering and you're you're trying to figure out, you're still game planning and all that sort of stuff. I think... I think one of the things that you can use these weeks heading up to the bowl season is actually teaching. So you're no longer sitting there trying to just plug holes to tr- to see if you can survive the Georgia, Texas A&M, South Carolina gauntlet. Now you're able to hopefully teach because quite honestly, I don't think you care too much about the outcome. You care about did these people learn? So th- that's sort of the stuff I'd be looking for is, you know, do they get pressure on the quarterback? What can Jack Miller do consistently? And then can they run the ball without having the threat at quarterback? I think those questions will go a long way towards telling us whether Florida's on the right track. You know, you hear all the talk about Napier needing an offensive coordinator. It'll be interesting to see with another quarterback whether some of the same issues, whether some of the same inconsistencies sit there or whether, uh, you know, some of those were due to Anthony Richardson and, and just some of those things get cleaned up. Yeah, be interesting to see. But I think both teams will want to come in and just run the ball uh, if they can, not put their quarterbacks in any kind of precarious situations here with, with, with this one. Looking at just a little bit of Oregon State and, of course, watching Florida all year. And look, we know this Florida offense will get rolling. Um, if it gets rolling, it will be in the run game uh, there. Maybe open up that play action there for Jack Miller. But yeah, I'll, go, I'll have a preview later on this week, kind of like a normal. I mean, it kind of falls in line. It's a game on Saturday, so everything kind of stays the same this week. And we don't have to change the schedule much for a bowl game like we like, like we normally do. Uh, but Saturday, two thirty Eastern, Florida, Oregon State in the Las Vegas Bowl. When will you have your uh, preview up? Will midweek Thursday somewhere around there? Yeah, it'll be up Wednesday or Thursday, and. Uh, um... You know, it, it's tough. I'm, I'm struggling to get up for this one, man. I mean, I'm obviously going to watch it. I love the 2.30 start time because my kid's going to get to – my seven-year-old's going to get to watch it with me. So that'll be fun. The 7.30 start would have been rough for him. But uh, um, So I love the 2.30 start. I love that it's on a Saturday, all that sort of stuff. But, uh, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff I'm looking forward to in this one. But uh, And I keep having to remind myself, we only get 13 of these. Yep. <laughs> and you got to enjoy it. But like you said, like we said when we started, like the recruiting aspect of stuff with early signing day and all that sort of stuff is really coming fast. And out of all the places where your attention is sort of divided, certainly a lot of it's divided there. So hopefully the Gators come out of this one with a win. And, yeah, we'll have a preview up midweek. All right. Sounds good. You can find it at readandreaction.com. You can follow Will at Will Miles SEC on Twitter. Uh, one more thought out there. Hopefully uh, everything comes okay here, but uh, thoughts, condolences, Mike Leach, uh, everybody I think out there kind of following along that uh, popular college football storyline out there. Hopefully uh, makes it through there. I know a lot of the messages and rumors out there are not good uh, in the form of Mike Leach uh, making it through this, Will, but uh, scary situation. Um, very one, you know, one of the best personalities uh, out there for college football and hopefully hopefully pulls through yeah i mean an innovator right an innovator in in college football and and uh you know this can happen to anybody and you know the the reality is is that out of all the people who would have help nearby and those sorts of things leach is one of those folks who would so hopefully um, they got to him in time hopefully he's able to recover and hopefully we see him back on the sidelines terrorizing a sideline reporter in in the not too distant future but uh you know, irrespective of that, I think, you know, prayers out to his family, um, you know, really tough time for them. And certainly with all the news leaking and stuff like that on Twitter, um, you know, that, that, that makes it even, that makes it even tougher, right? Like you're sitting there watching your dad or your, or your husband or your, or your uncle or whatever, struggle through something. And all of a sudden you got people uh, posting stuff on Twitter about what may be happening or, or what may not be happening. So um, hopefully some of those reports are wrong. Hopefully he's able to fully recover and we'll see him back soon, but regardless, you know, prayers to his family and, uh, and, and hopefully he gets better. Absolutely. Get well, Coach. Uh, hopefully, man. That's just a scary situation, man. That's just – it's kind of out of nowhere. I mean, he's at practice Saturday, and then all of a sudden, you know, you, you hear hear this going uh, and you hear this happening. So, hopefully, pulls through there uh, there in, in, in Starkville. 
So everybody, you know, kind of if you're on social media, uh, ESPN, I'm sure we'll be covering it too. Uh, just kind of stay glued to that. Hopefully, all the good news uh, will come from, from from that situation. So, all right, Will, thanks for uh, hopping on here again. We'll do it one more time. Uh, watch our Gators Saturday. We'll get together next Monday and uh, two days before early signing day. We'll review Florida's bowl game and look a uh, look ahead, peek ahead uh, to Wednesday and early signing day. So for Will. I am David Waters, host of Gators Breakdown. You can find me on Twitter at GatorDave underscore SEC. Guys and girls out there, thank you for listening to this episode of Gators Breakdown.